Okay, well, great. Um, well, listen, I think we've got um, quite a lot of people here. We're excited because uh, about 150 people have registered for this. So that is an outstanding turnout. So that's great. And people are still coming in right now, but uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, and uh, let's, uh, let's get into it. So thanks everyone again for coming. Uh, thanks for joining. We really appreciate you taking an interest in, in Air Race E. And as you know, you are here to hear about the first ever electric airplane race. So this is an exciting, momentous, uh, we, what we think is a very historic uh, moment in motorsport and in aviation. Um, this is a, an exciting new frontier we're embarking on. And uh, we're, again, really grateful to have everyone's uh, peaked interest in, in Air Race E. So what we're going to do today is, uh, it's going to be about an hour long. Uh, I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes and just kind of give an overview of, of what we do and what we're all about. And then we've got, as you see here we've, on your screen, we've got uh, two uh, experts with us, two, actually they're uh, team principals for two of the race teams. And they're going to talk a little bit about the experience of racing and what it's like to get set up and started with a team. And then we're going to go into a half hour of Q&A. So then it's over to you guys, uh, the audience, for, uh, for about half an hour and ask your questions. Uh, we ask that um, if you could ask the, type the questions rather into the Q&A box, there should be a button on your screen uh, and type your questions in there, either at the end or as you go and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Uh, we can't call on everyone through the mic as easy as possible. So, uh, so we'll do it through, the, through typing the questions and then we'll go from there. So just uh, quickly a little bit about myself, very, very briefly. Uh, I'm the founder of uh, Air AC and I've spent most of my professional career in air racing actually uh, and in air sports. And I can say that I'm actually the only person in the world who's organized international airplane races. Uh, and I'm, I'm referring to the kind where planes are, are actually racing uh, directly against each other. Um, so, and I've organized at least 15 of those on four different continents all around the world. So I've dedicated my professional career to this, uh, to this field. Uh, I'm also the member of a number of, I'm a director in a number of uh, different sports organizations. You can see uh, the list there. Um, and this is, this is my primary focus, and, and the same with the team and the ARAC team. This is what we do. Then we're going to come to uh, Carl in, in a little bit. Um, he's an exceptional engineer who recently founded a new company to develop uh, technologies and electrification, and he's one of the team principals. So he's going to talk to you in a little bit about his experience so far. And then Scott Holmes, who is uh, also a very uh, experienced uh, and very popular airplane racer. So he's a, he's a, he's a veteran air racer and he's um, uh, going to be talking about his leap from, you know, classic uh, conventional racing into electric racing. Uh, we're going to come back. We're going to, by the way, at the end of this presentation, you're going to have a copy of this presentation. So you can go back and learn a little bit more about these guys. And they're also going to be presenting in a few minutes. So I'll let them introduce themselves in more detail. So uh, the fundamental point, what's it all about? What are we doing here? So obviously it's electric airplane racing. Um, what we're really trying to do is take air racing and the aerospace industry into the future. So that's the fundamental goal. We're trying to create a platform for the acceleration of the technology of electrification. That's really the, the fundamental goal is to serve the industry and do something really big and really important to progress that. Um, Kind of the best way to describe it, I often refer to Formula E. Most of you know the uh, the car, the electric car races. Formula E have, have had a spectacular trajectory, and we're really following in their footsteps. So we're doing for aerospace what Formula E has done for automotive. So fundamentally, we are a motorsport and a very exciting one at that. So coming to motorsport, um, as you know, motorsport has uh, throughout its history been a launch pad for bringing new technologies to market. And, uh, you know, and that's what we're doing here. And what, what I think what, even though people are very familiar with motorsport, not everyone is familiar with air racing as a segment of motorsport. And air racing has a very rich history in the motorsport field. Um, there's, there's many examples. I mean, I, probably the most sort of classic famous example is, is the Supermarine Spitfire. You know, the Spitfire was uh, you know, one of the most famous warbirds to come out of World War II, in fact, in all history, probably. 
uh, one of the most su successful planes. And that Spitfire actually got its start in the Schneider Trophy in the 20s and 30s. So it was an air racer long before it was a warbird. So, you know, that heyday was used in air racing to, to really uh, carry aerospace forward. And that's exactly where we're at again in a new heyday of air racing to carry the electrification uh, forward in the technology. Um, and we're doing that uh, with a lot of parties. It's not just me and my team and, and these guys here. Uh, there's, there's a lot of history as well. Uh, for example, the Formula One sport uh, and the IF1 Association have been involved in air racing for over 75 years. And it's very important that you actually learn a little bit about Formula One air racing, uh, because that's the format we're basing Air Race E on. And Formula One air racing has had a very, very successful, like I said, 75 years of history. Uh, and to this day, they're racing around the world. And we actually will work with them to organize uh, those races as well. And the reason that's important is because, like I said, we're, Air Race E is coming from Formula One Air Racing. So uh, Air Race E is, uh, you know, it's based on those rules for Formula One. It's a formula, but we're converting it to electric. Um, to give you an idea uh, of the sport, and by the way, I should mention at this point, uh, in your sidebar uh, in the chat, you should now uh, see a link to a short video, it's about a minute long, you're welcome to watch it now, uh, to, it just shows a little bit more in video form uh, what we actually do in our air racing. But to help you visualize it, this is eight airplanes that start on the runway, lining up in a grid pattern, much like cars would, wave the green flag, the planes take off, they climb to 10, 15 meters above the ground, 400, 450 kilometers per hour, racing around an oval circuit, all eight aircraft together, First one across the line wins. So it's true, pure motorsport, really thrilling, really exciting and demanding on the technology and the pilots and the teams. It's everything you can kind of visualize in motorsport. And it's all in front of a crowd. So you can see here the rough dimensions of the circuit. Uh, it's a closed circuit. Um, it's about a five kilometer distance each lap. Now in Formula One air racing, uh, the teams do eight laps in a race. In electric racing, the fundamental difference is that we're going to be doing four laps, and you, most of you know why. I mean, it's the batteries and the technology are, are still evolving. Um, but it's a four-lap race, and short and sweet, but we do multiple races in a day. So, you know, the rules. I mean, of course, this is really what's of most interest, I think, to a lot of people, because everyone here... Uh, you know, is, is coming because, uh, you know, obviously you're invited because you have some interest in either joining a team, forming a team, building a race plane, uh, getting involved in somehow, uh, in some way with the teams. So the rules, of course, are the, the you know, the bedrock of what we do. Um, now, the rules, as I mentioned, are based on the Formula One rules. So effectively, everything is the same operationally, procedurally, uh, and technically except where it concerns the powertrain. So we're changing everything for purposes of the electric powertrain and, and the rest is fundamentally the same because the IF1 association has spent, like I said, 75 years evolving a really good set of rules, safe, reliable, and known and, and effective. So we're you know basing it on that, but making it electric. Uh, just a couple points to pull out here. Uh, we, uh, there's uh, the, the power of the motor is limited to 150 kilowatts. Uh, there's going to be a 30 second window when the teams can boost up to 175. So that should be a really exciting moment of the race where each team can choose its moment. Um, as I said, it's a four lap race. So that's about a five minute, more or less five minutes at full power. And then of course we need to, you need some reserve to land. So that's 10, 10 minutes of reserve uh, at roughly 30% power. Uh, we we can guesstimate that. I mean, we know it's four laps, but the, the size of the battery, the amount of charge is really up to the teams and we establish rules to test if they're gonna return, of course, with enough power to get back, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the most important thing about the rules, I think, is that it's an open platform. This was absolutely a necessity for us to keep it an open platform so that it's open to all manufacturers, all designers, all engineers, it's a, it's a platform that anyone can get into if you can meet the qualifications and your plane can meet those, the formula rules, uh, you can compete and you can build it. So uh, that's important so that we're not just testing the pilots in the race course, we're testing the technology. So really fundamental importance there, open platform, 
uh, is really exciting, real, real competition on, on every aspect. Uh, we, we're gaining tons of momentum in, in the marketplace. Of course, we're trying to bring in the, uh, the industry. We want to be the hub of what the, uh, you know, and the leading edge of where, of where the industry is going in electrification. Uh, we're demonstrating this, validating it by bringing in these partners. Airbus came on board as the official founding partner. They've been really, really integral in helping nurture the sport and get us going and working with the teams. Uh, that's it. That's very exciting. Um, and we are, uh, oop, I think I might have lost some light. Uh, and then we've got uh, ANSYS, which is the official simulation software partner. And they've come on board and really getting hands on into the uh, into helping the teams use their uh, their tools, their simulation tools, uh, which are market leading and and training, providing training and education and working with those teams to, to help hone their designs. We've got a number of other partners involved. Uh, they're coming in all the time. We're having conversations all the time. They come in sometimes working directly with a team, supporting a team, being a team. In other cases, they're working with the series like Airbus and ANSYS, uh, summer universities, other organizations, manufacturers, really, really, really exciting ecosystem. <clears throat> this slide really is meant to just highlight that we're also a fan-based sport. You know, So this is something that is going around the world. We're reaching thousands of spectators. Uh, we've got media uh, uh, established, uh, you know, high profile media and TV coverage established all around the world through our other air racing activities. So it's already there. We're leveraging that for air racing. So we're already off to a good start and, and we're expecting tens of thousands of spectators. So it's both for, you know, technology development and industry, but at the end of the day, it's also a fun motorsport. Of course, I'm sure you're all wondering where we're going to be. We're going to be making some announcements uh, fairly soon, and we're actually uh, going through a formal uh, bidding process at the moment to, to really help isolate the, the short list of the interested venues we're talking to um, for 2022 and beyond. Now, our focus now is to set the official 2022 series as the first inaugural series of races. Uh, they're going to take, we're going to do three races in 22 and we're going to grow to eight races in 2025. Now, importantly, uh, and very excitingly next year, we're already going to be doing qualifying rounds. So the teams that want to join and get involved in the 22 series are already going to be having to prove their plane is ready by the end of next year at actual quali qualifying events. So they're going to be doing simulated racing, training, qualifying laps, et cetera, to, to prove that they're ready to race. So there's a lot of pressure on in a short time frame, um, but a lot of activity next year. 2021 is going to be really exciting as all these teams take to the air. I should note that if you don't, not, if you're not convinced you can get ready for the 2022 series, no problem. We welcome people to get involved now. Some people have a longer planning horizon. So if you think you're interested in 2023 and onwards, come along and get involved anyways. Uh, I mentioned media coverage. We can send a lot of information out later. We've got extensive media coverage across uh, aviation media, non-aviation media, consumer media, non-industry media. It, it, everyone's really interested in this. So we're very proud of that. And I guess, you know, my last kind of point to, to focus on here is, okay, so why get involved? You know, what, what's in it for me as a race team? Uh, and of course, the answer is a lot. It's a lot, a lot of things. And, um, you know, I, I suppose the, you know, the, the fundamental thing for us that we think is the most rewarding is that, you know, you can be at the pioneering edge of the technology development. You know, where aviation is, is going into a new phase, a new generation. We know that. And everyone in this room, even by attending this meeting, you're already at the leading edge of that. So if you want to harness that, capture that, and be, be part of that movement, um, you know, Air AC is the place to do it. It's the place to explore and experiment and, and evolve these technologies and be connected. So on a more practical level, obviously, we can test your technologies. Anyone who's designing things has a good uh, place, a proving ground. Uh, to, to work on it. And that can also carry forward. A lot of teams are developing things that they'll use in actual consumer, you know, pro and production model airplanes uh, at the end of the day. Um, there's networking, business development opportunities, commercial opportunities, uh, sports sponsorship, of course, being a big factor in that. And as we get more and more established, that's really starting to increase awareness and that has value for a team. 
um, you know, based on some of that media coverage that we already talked about. And even on a, on a, on a, on a current practical day-to-day -day level, we've already got a number of deals signed by suppliers and providers and other types of partners. Uh, we mentioned ANSYS is huge coming in with its products and getting those products to the teams, uh, a, a very big suite, a whole portfolio of software and tools that they use for the simulation and helping the engineers get their planes ready. Uh, and, uh, and, and of course, you know, help with the training. We've got discounts from motor manufacturers. We've, uh, you know, we've got discounts from battery manufacturers, uh, even a free brake assembly from the market leader in, in, in brakes. Uh, so it comes from all different angles. We've got a long list of different offers and opportunities, um, and that that's not including the direct partnerships that the teams are developing themselves with manufacturers, industry suppliers, providers, and and regular consumer sponsors. Um, so each team, important to say, owns its own business, owns the playing, develops it, um, and 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 has the rights to that. And obviously, there's a, a network. You become part of the fabric of what we're doing. And you know, the, the, if you if you enter a team, you can benefit from the relationship with our our current partners, our future partners. Uh, you have access to our PR team, uh, so we actually can function as a as a PR office and help you communicate to the world your ambitions and your your news and your updates and your developments. And of course, lastly, uh, and maybe the most important thing is a hell of a lot of fun. It is an exciting motorsport. It's a great group of people to be a part of. And, uh, and again, you know, we've already, like I mentioned, we, you know, we, we launched this, this info session uh, a bit spontaneously, but a couple of weeks ago, and we've got 150 people signed up who are 150 people that are interested in developing race teams or participating in a race team. And that is, is, a, is a great, uh, you know, it's very welcome uh, by us and, and we're excited. So on that note, I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Scott um, so he can introduce himself a little bit better and he's gonna speak for about five minutes and tell you about his experience. And, uh, and then we'll move on to Carl after that and we'll take your questions. So Scott, go ahead. Sure, thanks Jeff. Um, so I'm Scott Holmes I'm from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, uh, north of the border. Uh, we race uh, with the Air Race One Series and in the Reno Air Races down in Reno, Nevada every year. The picture on the right is from the Reno Air Races last year. That's about uh, half of the team that made it down. Uh, I thought I'd uh, talk a little bit about what happens in a race, um, how much fun we have, the family experience, that kind of thing. Um, early on, so especially as a, as a rookie racer, you're expected to show up with an airplane that is uh, maintained properly and ready to race and uh, able to make it through the, the full race week or four days or whatever the race timeline is uh, without any significant breakdowns. So it's really, really important that you come prepared. Uh, once you, once you uh, arrive at the race location, the first thing we do is assemble our airplanes. Most of these airplanes run high power settings, uh, so and they're very uh, unstable and uncomfortable, which makes them difficult to ferry to race locations. Uh, when the race locations are international, such as the Air Race 1 series, it's virtually impossible to ferry. So what we do is uh, we take the wings off. Formula planes are designed to come apart really easily. Um, we load them into containers, take them to the race location, and then reassemble them uh, on site. Uh, for example, that red plane there, that's a Cassett racer, which is a fairly common F1 uh, airplane. Uh, and the wing comes off with, I think, six bolts. It'll come right out the top. Uh, four on the main spar, two on the rear spar. So it's fairly straightforward. Um, once the airplane's assembled, the first thing that we'll do then is a, a tech inspection. And that's very important for safety. We'll be in the pit area with all the other crews uh, right next to you. You'll see all the airplanes, 24 of them usually uh, in the pits, uh, each in their own assigned pit stall. Um, we'll do a tech inspection, which involves weight and balance, going through the motors to make sure that the airplane is race rules compliant. Uh, and then also looking for some basic safety items, although the airplane should be airworthy already as per the, the airworthiness uh, uh, regulations from your home country. Um, once the airplane is, is tech inspected and uh, signed off for racing, we'll then do a test flight and then move right away into qualifications. Um, uh, we'll qualify by running two laps on the course. Uh, the course is, as Jeff showed in his slides, uh, six telephone poles usually or, or pylons or, or some kind of marker out over the racetrack right next to the runway. We'll do two laps. Uh, usually there's two aircraft on the course at once for qualifying, uh, two laps on the clock, 
and then that will that will constitute the I guess starting list for the heat racing. Uh, to heat race, what we do is we'll run usually two or three heat races uh, for the race, uh, and that will be eight airplanes at once. Uh, we'll be uh, we'll organize ourselves into the uh, three groupings: gold, silver, and bronze. Uh, the top eight qualifiers are in the gold. The middle eight are in the silver. The bottom eight are in the bronze. Uh, and then uh, we'll run a gold heat race, silver heat race, bronze heat race every day, sometimes two of those per day, depending on the race schedule. Um, in every heat race, if, if an airplane, say, wins the bronze, there's an opportunity to move up to the silver per the race rules. So if you blow a motor or have an emergency uh, in, in qualifying or don't get a qualifying time for whatever reason, there's an opportunity to make it back up through the uh, the different groupings into the gold race, which most people consider is where all the marbles are. Um, at the end of the race week, we'll do the, the final race, the gold race, the silver race, or the bronze race. And that determines the outcome of the, the whole race week. Uh, so the, you generally, you, we consider the top three in the gold as the winners of the event. Um, however, there's also uh, usually uh, trophies for the silver and bronze winners as well. Uh, to learn how to do this, uh, we do uh, a rookie school usually in June. Uh, typically for the Reno Air Races, it's um, Reno's in September, so rookie school is typically in June. Uh, I think for Air Race C, we'll have other rookie schools, probably in other locations as well. Uh, and in that rookie school is basically where you still show up with an airplane generally and learn to fly the course. Uh, to qualify to race, you have to qualify the airplane and you have to qualify the pilot. And that involves a qualification flight, including 6G pulls, uh, demonstration of, of uh, laps that are flown consistently with constant altitude and so on. And then also a demonstration of a what we call a mayday, which is typically a pull off the course and then glide in for, for landing on the runway. Um, this is uh, most of my friends, all are, are now F1 racers. Uh, the majority of my friends live in other cities. Uh, we come together as a big family uh, at, at the Air Race One and Reno Air Race uh, events every year. Uh, it's by far the most fun I've ever had in my entire life. Uh, as you can see, my crew keeps growing. Every time we bring people down, they tend to always want to come back. Um, the people there, the characters are incredible. I've never seen it in my life. Uh, and then also on top of that, it's a, it's a technical challenge and a way to challenge yourself and your crew to, to try and accomplish something in aviation uh, most people don't get a chance to accomplish. Uh, so that's kind of the uh, the gist of racing from, from where we are in present, and I expect air racing to be fairly similar in the future. Great, excellent, fantastic summary, Scott. Thanks. You you really you know project that that excitement and enthusiasm that uh, really is prevalent in the sport. Okay, great. Um, and by the way, Scott um, and Carl are both going to stick around for the questions, so you guys can also direct some questions at these guys if you want. Um, we're all going to try to field your questions. Um, and uh, at this moment, I'll hand over to Carl, and he's uh, he's going to chat to you about a few things. So, go ahead, Carl. Awesome. Well, um, it's a real pleasure to be here and to talk to all of you. I want to know, uh, unlike Scott, who comes at this with a tremendous amount of experience in Formula One racing, I knew absolutely nothing about it when I got involved with uh, Air AC. I actually own and operate an advanced high-tech uh, motor company, so we're producing next generation of very light motors. And so uh, someone uh, brought this new league to my attention. Uh, I sat there and thought about it for a few days, and I thought, you know what, I absolutely uh, have to and want to be a part of this. And to echo a point that Jeff made earlier in the presentation, the thing that excites me the most um, about this league is that every single thing we do, all of us, all of the teams, everything we do is the world's first. And when, when are the, um, with, with the way the world is and technology and connectivity, when are we all going to get to be a part of something that's a world first? So. Um, that was the, one of the first and, and, and primary key uh, points. And for me, coming from a, an engineering background, a technical background, technology background, um, also being able to, to demonstrate um, technology and to push humanity forward, to move the, the, the goalposts forward on, on future tech, current tech, future tech, and, and et cetera. And then be involved in something as exciting as uh, doing that in aviation. You want to talk about 
you know, next to going to space, this is probably the most extreme venue in which to push new technologies. And, and uh, I'm clearly, uh, as, a, as a serial entrepreneur, I'm not risk averse. So uh, jumping into this uh, was, was really exciting. The technical challenges um, for me, uh, getting up to speed quickly, having to absorb a lot of information from aviation, applying my, my, my knowledge of motors and, and electricity and, and batteries and systems um, and to execute on something uh, uh, really revolutionary. The, the, that challenge and excitement, pulling together a team. And then I wanna echo something that, that Scott said as well, which is the family that's around this already and the people and the quality of the people. Um, everyone I've met uh, and everyone I've been engaged with just been some of the most amazing people uh, I've ever had the privilege of working with. So uh, that's what got me excited. That's what got me interested. Um, uh, something else, just kind of a uh, funny side note, is as an entrepreneur and startup uh, person, you know, a guy who loves startups, um, they're not easy, they're very difficult. And, um, you know, you spend the majority of your time kind of beating your head on a wall trying to get people to come in and support and fund the, this cutting edge technology. I stand up an air racing team and I've got people coming out of the word works, volunteering their time and, and throwing assets and resources. It's just a completely new, new realm and the excitement, the passion behind it is, is really exciting. And so, um, you know, rapidly putting together a team. I know the slide says we've jumped from two to seven, but I'm actually over 20 team members right now from engineering and software development and aviation experts and, and all of the above. So it's, it's really, um, it's been uh, just a huge boost for me. And I'm, I'm very excited about what we're gonna do as a league and, and supporting all my fellow team members. I mean, I want us all breaking records and, and moving humanity forward in, in, in the efforts we're doing, so. I think I think everything else I can say for Q and A. All right, perfect. Thank you, Carl. Again, uh, Carl's also taken a, a great leap of faith to to join us, uh, and it's nice to get people. And he's a great example of how somebody who who doesn't have uh, race or even potentially your sports experience of any kind can really get involved um, and drive it from a, a you know a tech perspective, and and then go seek the other partners that are going to be necessary. So Scott comes comes at it from uh, from a race experience, uh, Carl from a technology experience, and I, and I can already tell from the the makeup of this audience that you know there's manufacturers, there's students, um, you know engineers, pilots, ground crew. It, it really it's it's the people that have the, share the vision and the spark will drive it forward, and then piece together the other members of the team. No no one of you in the audience is going to be able to do it all yourself. Uh, it's it's a team effort. That's what. If, you know, that's why it's a motorsport team, um, but it's got to start with someone and uh, and that's that's what we're looking for. So again, congratulations and thanks to these two, as well as our other teams, I should mention, we have uh, actually 14 registered teams. We've got 12 uh, teams that we've that have been with us uh, for a while. We've got two more just in the past week um, that have registered and uh, we're hoping out of this uh, group today that we can find some more. Uh, the idea is to get to 16 steady state teams in 2022, and there could be more. So depending on the, the demand, uh, there's lots of space. Anyways, I'm going to hand it over to the audience and see if we can answer some of your specific questions. Um, we've already got a number of uh, really great questions here, and it's kind of, I'm not really sure where to begin. I think the presenters can open up our Q&A uh, window. And I'll pick out a couple. I, look, some of them are kind of paired together. I think we can. I'll try to answer one or two, and then, and then see if Scott and Carl have spotted a couple questions that they'd like to answer, uh, perhaps on the rules side. Um, let me first take the very first question. Uh, very good question. How do the teams earn money, uh, and how do they maintain themselves? You know, is, is it a viable business or is it an expense for the teams? It's all of the above. Uh, we the team is owned by you. So when a team is formed, the team owners, you know, own it. If that's a third party to us, we run the events, the series, we provide the, the platform and the showcase uh, for you to race and the rules, et cetera, et cetera, on the technical side at the events and the promotion internationally. But the teams are responsible for building the aircraft and managing and running the team. So of course there's gonna be an expense 
probably not as great as you think it could be, but it's a significant, meaningful expense. And having said that, this is a big opportunity, is a big commercial opportunity, and sponsors are indeed taking this very seriously. Uh, we're obviously in a very challenging year right now, but even, even, even under these circumstances, we're already having great conversations because we're talking about 2022. So sponsors will start to come on board by next year in a really big way. And there's, there's a lot of opportunity on the sponsor side, on the commercial side. Um, so it's, but it's a bit of risk, you know, there's, a, there's an investment you would make. I should mention that we don't actually charge any entry fees. So there's no, there's no, you know, in normal motorsports, especially on a big high profile global level, they'd be charging tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe a lot more for very established sports. Uh, we don't do that. So we work with you to keep the cost down. Um, there was a, a similar question. Yeah, someone just also asked about the uh, sponsorship and partnerships available. We work with the teams to help them get those partners. Uh, fundamentally, it's the team's responsibility and the team's right and the team's benefit to keep the road revenues. Uh, but we can also work with you and help uh, help you get, you know, home your pitch and find the targets and that sort of thing. Um, so you're not you're not alone in this. Um, there's a and I don't mind chiming in too on the funding side of things. And so uh, my approach is to run it like a business. That's what I do. That's that's my focus. Um, but uh, absolutely, you have to uh, consider the cost uh, when you're getting in there. But what you're going to find is that there's a lot of excitement um, and a lot of interest in what we're doing. I mean, even though um, it's not in, in the forefront of popular culture at this particular time, there's still a lot of passion and excitement about aviation. And uh, especially with, uh, I mean, you're reading something every day in the news about electric aviation and, and electric aircraft. And so this is a prime time to get involved in that particular field, but also to consider that, you know, as we're, uh, Jeff mentioned this earlier, as we're pushing forward and developing those aircraft, we are actually creating new solutions for aviation that have market potential. In addition to that, you're going to find uh, that, uh, that you'll be able to form partnerships with different providers and get sponsorships. And those things really help to augment and offset uh, the cost going forward. Um, and then people are going to want to be uh, associated with what you're doing and have their name on your entries and, and the accomplishments your team's uh, targeting. And so you'll be able to raise money from sponsors. Um, you'll get partnerships, which are kind of like an in-kind mix with funding. Um, and, 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 you know, you'll, you'll also be, you know, putting, putting out of pocket time and a, a lot of time and out of pocket money into these as well. But if you focus it, um, uh, if you, if you put a focus, it's my, my experience on the marketing and the, the messaging of your team and what you're doing, um, it can, it can also be a, a viable business, uh, as from a cash flow standpoint. So those are, those are kind of my, my high level thoughts on that. Great, thanks, thanks. And uh, again, by all means, Scott and Carl, just jump in if and when you, you know, as you want, as you want to answer anything uh, or add to it. Um, I'll ask. There's a couple questions I can answer very quickly with a yes or no, and uh, and then those folks can can feel free to get in touch with me directly. You can see our details for all of us on the screen there, uh, and we can talk in more detail. Uh, but just to run through some of these quickly, uh, someone has asked if. Uh, in, in, in Formula One, there, there used to be pusher style uh, aircraft um, included. And, uh, and will the rules allow in Ares E for pusher style aircraft? The simple answer is yes. So that, that is uh, an option in this particular uh, event. Um, there was a, a question. Oops, sorry. Oh, they, the question seemed to reshuffle when I did that. <laughs> um, Uh, as I'm looking here, uh, Scott, Carl, do you guys spot any questions that you want to answer, perhaps maybe about the rules? Yeah, I, I can answer a couple of them here. Um, uh, the question is, why the limit of 150 kilowatts, and how is this tested at race time? Um, Jeff, you might be able to answer better how it's tested, um, but I know uh, with our airplanes right now, the course is set. It's limited in, in its turn radius. Uh, higher power means higher speed. 
and higher speed means higher G in the corners and we're already over three and a half G. Uh, so more power means the airplanes need to be much stronger, but also the G forces get to a point where they, they start to become a safety issue. Yeah, and how do you measure it? I must say, uh, these are, there's some, there's separate rules. The rules, and by the way, I think uh, I might've mentioned that if I didn't, the rules are available in this chat at the end of the meeting. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna put a link on the sidebar in the uh, chat room, uh, and you guys can click on that link and you can go download this presentation, the official rules, the current version of the official rules, um, and uh, and also an expression of interest um, if you'd like to get involved. Um, so if you want to start to you know connect with us and, and build that relationship, there's going to be a form that you can fill out as well. Um, so those three things will be in the link uh, to the side. You'll notice in the rules, uh, the rules for development are set. The rules for adjudicating and testing are still in development. So we can say that, okay, that's gonna be measured on the DC output of the battery, um, but how and when and where we do that, a lot of this testing and adjudication uh, rules for the jury is still being developed. And importantly, we do that with the team. So the teams who uh, are developing uh, at the right rate to meet the 22 series, we include them in the process of shaping the rules. So I think that's also important. It doesn't come from some ivory tower somewhere, here's the rules, and you guys are stuck with that. We have a lot of interaction with, with the teams and our partners and other, other, other third parties uh, to, you know, to get involved and, and shape it. Because at the end of the day, it needs to be something that's relevant to the industry. It needs to be something that's safe, on, above all. And it needs to be something that you know can work, is workable. So the rules are always having those things in mind. Um, I, I, I noticed there was a question also about a uh, prototype. We, we actually do have a prototype in work in the University of Nottingham, uh, which has been doing some work on uh, taking a cassette racer and, and making a prototype out of that. Um, and you know the reality is we've also got a lot of other teams that are building like Carl's, uh, you know, and planes that are being put together, which effectively they're not prototypes, but they're also uh, being actually built now and started. And we're expecting testing to be February, March. They're going to be uh, air trials. Um, so this is well underway. Some of the teams are well underway, and other teams are, you know, uh, not in the same position. Um, but we do have some planes coming to fruition. Um, we also last November had showcased one that was put together. It wasn't airworthy, but it was showcased at the Dubai Air Show already in last November. So a lot of progress is being made. Um, so I don't mind answering a couple of questions that are in the in the Q and A regarding the airframes. And so uh, now, uh, I believe all of us that I'm aware, all the teams I'm aware of, we're using some of the more standard airframes that are currently being used in Formula One, and we're modifying them and, uh, and optimizing them for the particular electric uh, propulsion systems that we're developing. We're all kind of de independently developing our platforms and our, our drivetrains, but we're taking the you know, some traditional already produced F1 uh, aircraft and we're modifying them for the, those applications. And so um, uh, most everyone now, I believe, has an airframe that they're already um, in development on. Uh, some of the, you know, like, like Scott mentioned before, one of the most popular airframes is the, the CASET uh, platform. So, uh, but there's, you know, we're, you know, there's lots of people doing modifications to that and, and customs as well. Um, and then on the powertrain, uh, someone asked a question about, you know, other green technologies. We are, um, exclusively electric. Um, so we're not doing hybrid systems, uh, fuel-based systems. We're doing, the, the rules are basically you need, you have to have electrochemical storage, whatever that is, whatever type of battery, whatever kind of charge, you have to be retaining a charge. There's no, uh, uh, you know, we're not going to do like a, you know, a gas or diesel electric hybrid kind of thing or a natural gas electric hybrid. It's, it's got to be a charged system and, and you're, you're dissipating that charge. While you're while you're racing, so to answer answer that question. Great, great, thanks, thanks, Carl. Um, Scott, I see a number of questions. <clears throat> excuse me, a number of questions relating to, you know, how how do I get involved? What what criteria do I need to to be a pilot? Um, how how do I train? 
um, you know, there's a lot of questions about uh, people that want to fly and participate in that side, or even as a crew chief or an engineer. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about how we do it in Formula One air racing, which will, again will be very similar to air race E. Air race E will also have its own training and additional training and electrification training, training on the charging procedures and a number of other things. But as an initial starting point, Formula One is a great place to look. And Scott, you have experience in that. Yeah, I can talk to that one easy. I see lots of pilot questions as well, experience questions and so on. Um, the, in, in this kind of air racing, we don't focus so much on qualifications. We focus more on demonstrated competence. Uh, so what that means is uh, in, a, in a race, you very much need to know how to control your airplane and fly your airplane. That skill comes from flying it a lot at home, at your own home airport, uh, learning the airplane uh, through and through completely, just like it's like you're wearing a sweater kind of thing. Um, once you once you know the basics on how to control your airplane, how to land it in crosswind, how to land it uh, uh, in high gusty winds, how to land it in turbulence, how to fly it in turbulence, then we need to move on to other skills. Uh, and other skills in racing include formation. Uh, we do a lot of flying close proximity to other airplanes. Uh, that skill is gained by flying a lot of formation in your racing airplane at home uh, with your friends and so on. Uh, you can take lots of seminars and courses on formation flying uh, all over the world. Um, we also end up in uh, unusual attitudes, uh, borderline aerobatics. Um, those skills come from flying lots of aerobatic airplanes at home. And uh, again, going back into your racer, uh, practicing doing the maneuvers that you'd have to in a race. Uh, one of the, the demonstrated uh, skills that you have to show in your qualification ride is uh, a half roll to inverted and then a half roll back without any major altitude loss. Uh, and that, that kind of shows that if on the course, when you end up in, in severe wake turbulence and end up rolled inverted, you have the skills to recover without hitting the ground. Um, the last one is uh, a lot of pilots, in fact, a, a very large amount of pilots could typically get a racing airplane through a standard race. Uh, but most, air, most races don't go according to plan exactly. And typically we end up with uh, uh, unplanned events, uh, maydays, uh, precautionary landings, um, some people not flying where they should be flying. Uh, so we end up in those um, uh, situations where they're not planned, they're kind of out of the blue, they're surprised. And that's where uh, the, the deep difficult skills come from or are needed where, uh, to race. So for example, if the engine fails, if you have a power failure, um, if you have a midair collision, uh, all of those uh, mayday situations that can happen in a race, you need to be able to handle in your airplane and should be prepared to handle in your airplane. And those skills, most of those come back to flying your airplane a lot at home in the, in the race configuration. Uh, not, not flying an F1 on gas a lot and then converting to electric and showing up with no time in type. It's about flying it on electric a lot. Um, so to answer people's questions, most of it comes down to experience and type. Yeah, and I'll answer one other question that's in here uh, regarding kind of what are the, what are the differences between the, the combustion flying and the electric flying? I'm going to talk from an engineering standpoint. I'll let Scott talk from the pilot standpoint on that. But um, from an engineering standpoint, you've got some, some really great benefits. You never have to worry about air fuel mixture. You never have to worry about whether you're inverted or the, the angle of, of your plane. I mean, electric motors, electric motor doesn't care what orientation it's in. Um, it's going to deliver torque when you're delivering current to it. Uh, on the counterbalance to that, you're dealing with some some heavier requirements on batteries. You've got you've got a motor which is a giant brick of steel. You've got batteries which are giant bricks of metals like lithium and other things, and you've got high voltage cables running all over the the uh, the machine. And traditional Formula One airplanes are really mechanically quite simple. Uh, whereas these electric planes are going to be very complicated. You're going to have controls that are required for running the motor, controls for managing and maintaining the battery. Depending on the chemistry in your battery, you may have concerns over, over discharge, creating heat, creating fire. So you need to have a solid engineering team around you uh, with, with addressing those situations. And it's going to probably add a lot more weight to the final system than, 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 than 
you can imagine. I mean, there's ways to trim and, and all everything we're doing is trying to optimize that. But you need to be aware of that going in that you might have a, a different CG issue with the plane. You're going to have different uh, 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 weighting, uh, weight distribution. You need to think about how far components are because of the losses um, based on the cabling you're doing and the length of that cable and the, the resistance of that cable and the, and and all of us. There, it's really an open platform, as Jeff said before, on the powertrain. So we have a wide variety of options on the voltages and currents and all the different technologies we're bringing together. But you've, you've also got greater points of failure if you get complex with it. You know, if the electronics fail, it doesn't matter how good your motor and battery are. That you need the electronics to manage and maintain the system. So those are the, the pluses and the minuses um, to, the, to those systems. Uh, and uh, I don't know if Scott has anything to add to that, how it affects the pilot, but uh, those are, those are yeah. my. That, yeah, that's what I mean exactly. The, the, the system side of things are very, very different in electric. Uh, so not only do you have to fly your airplane in race, but you also have to manage those systems, whatever that means. Uh, so it obviously makes sense to keep your system as carefree and maintenance free as possible. Jeff, you're on mute. There we are. Sorry. In what meeting does that not happen? Yeah. Okay. So um, earlier, I see also a lot more questions about about getting involved. I understand, of course, that's why that's why everyone's here, and that is a big question because it's an open ended question. There, unfortunately, the answer is there's a lot of ways to get involved, but that's good. There's a lot of paths to get involved. Uh, Scott has already talked about. Uh, the pilot qualifications. So how do you get, how do, you know, when you're looking in terms of getting involved on a skill basis, how do you do that? He's addressed that really well. Carl also mentioned uh, about the aircraft and how you can retrofit existing designs. And I just wanted to call that out again, because I see uh, a few more questions about, you know, hey, we've got the expertise, but, but you know, where do we begin with the aircraft? Uh, you know, we don't have necessarily the the, the powertrain components or the airframe. Um, a really good way to start and a really good way to ensure that you can be ready, even with a significant effort, by the first series in 2022 and the qualifications next year is to retrofit a Formula One racer. So the most common format or platform of racer in Formula One racing is the Cassett, Cassett 3M usually. Uh, a lot of them highly modified. They're all unique, they're all bespoke. Um, but they follow a, a very simple pattern and they're, they're really, really easy to work with. And there's other Formula One models. Um, our rules, again, are based on Formula One air racing. So you really see what's required of that. Um, but if you contact Cassett Aircraft, they can give you some plans. Uh, there are a number of Cassettes in the market. I, I must say, I actually own one that's for sale. <laughs> so that's a possibility as well. Um, so there's, you can get a Cassett and you can retrofit it. Um, and that's what a lot of teams are doing. So that would, that's a really easy way to do it. Uh, and then in terms of the propulsion system and the technology, again, we've got a lot of support inside the series, inside the teams. The teams collaborate with one another. That's one of the most beautiful things to see. The teams, I mean, they wanna have other teams to beat, right? So, you know, they want everyone to show up at the starting line. So everyone's helping everyone else to get, to get started and, and really cross-pollinating knowledge and contacts and leads. So that's really important. So. The shortest answer, which I should have started with, to get involved is contact us. Simple as that, and we'll help you get on the right path. We'll help you uh, connect with the right people. Uh, we also have a forum uh, that you can ac get access to where you can meet people and talk to people um, and, and network. So that's the first thing. Um, yeah, there's a ton of opportunity there, uh, but it all comes back to asking questions. That's how I got involved 10 years ago. Start asking questions, start meeting people, start telling people you want to get involved and asking what you can do to get involved. Exactly. Be proactive and, and jump out. Reach out to us. Reach out to Scott, Carl. There's other people uh, on our websites and social media. You'll see other teams who are involved. Um, talk to a local team. Talk to your local flying club and, and try to raise some awareness. Um, can yeah, really be a grassroots effort. Yeah, that was going to be my point is if, if you really want to know what it takes to get involved, uh, come, come join my team. Uh, I'm always looking for really good team members and uh, both engineers and av aviation, and it'd be a great way to, I mean, I tell you what, when you get into the community, you get a lot of support uh, of just some quality people and, and reaching out to the league. They have a, a long list of people 
to connect you with as well. Um, you know, come in and get your feet wet with helping Scott or I or some of the other teams. Um, and uh, and it's, it's a really great way to get involved. I see a lot of questions too about rules and sponsors and some of the partnerships that, that AirAC provides. I will say that uh, uh, the, the, a lot of that is provided once you're, once you're under a, a letter of interest with the league and, and you'll get access to all of that. I don't, I'm not sure, Je obviously Jeff uh, it manages that, but there are some of it that we just don't discuss until after you're already uh, under, under a confidentiality agreement with the league. So just to answer those questions that keep coming up. Yeah, and Car Carl's in Texas and winter is coming. <laughs> And that's the beautiful thing about being in Texas too. Even when winter comes, we usually have clear skies and fair weather. So uh, um, we're not snowed in. So un unfortunately, uh, you know, 40, 50% of the year is scorching hot and the rest of it's pretty nice. So. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Um, and uh, yeah, and again, I just want to say that, you know, I don't know, uh, I believe the audience can also see some of these questions, but uh, there, there's a lot of questions, which is really uh, rewarding to see, and I'm enthused to see. Obviously, we can't get to all of them. We've probably got five or 10 more minutes, I think. We can stay on and answer a few more questions. Uh, I do apologize if we don't get to all of these. We're trying to kind of group them into the most uh, prominent groups of questions. Um, but again, you've got our contact details on the screen there, uh, and we very much welcome you to get in touch. Also. The, on the, in the chat, I want to remind you that you, there's a link that you can actually download the, uh, the rules so you can actually see the rules uh, and kind of internalize them a little bit uh, and, you know, before you get in touch so you can have, uh, you know, very specific questions. Uh, there's a lot of questions here uh, about distributed propulsion, things like that, uh, RPMs. I mean, a lot of these things are coming. We're going to, what we want to do is we want to take the feedback from the industry and our partners and really find out where the technology, where we forecast it to be going and adapt the rules to always be serving the industry as well as the fan base. Um, so it's really important that if the industry wants to test certain things, we're going to carefully and it's slowly, you know, but adapt the rules to meet those, uh, those needs and those interests uh, from all the different stakeholders in the, in the series. Um, so the rules will change. We're gonna add things in. We're gonna be increasing the laps of, obviously it's a short race at the moment, um, you know, a lot's going to evolve. And I want I want to address one of the comments that I saw about open platform uh, means deep pockets wins, and I can I I it, I completely uh, uh, reject that particular statement because what the open platform does is it takes the chains off of you. Um, it does not lock you into. I mean, this has never been done, so there's no there's no set way of of doing an electric plane, and what the open uh, what, what the open requirements do is allow you to play with all the cutting edge technology and developments that are going on. But I can tell you an experienced uh, F1 racer with a group of volunteer uh, engineers, by a lot of excitement, by the way, um, engineers, I mean, we're all nerds and we all grew up dreaming of flight and space and sci-fi and just to be a part of something that's cutting edge and exciting. Uh, there, I mean, I don't, I don't have a single paid member on my team. They're all doing it volunteer. They're all putting in tremendous hours in their evenings and weekends. Um, it's not a deep pocket thing. It is an excitement. It is a passion. It is a commitment. Um, and, I, and I actually think that when you get the right mix of the right pilot and the right, uh, the right uh, technical support team, that's that's pushing, pushing the edge, pushing technology. Um, that's what's going to win. I don't think it has anything to do with money. It's not like we're, you know, someone's buying the next generation header. Uh, you know, it, it's it really is true innovation. So I just kind of wanted wanted to address that particular point. Yeah, that was a, a great summary, Carl. I mean, that is the fundamental, you know, mission of this is to is to innovate, to accelerate the development, and that's what everyone's interested in, and that's where also the revenues for the teams can come in, the sponsors and the partners. I um, also want to just quickly say there's a lot of people that are saying great event. Thanks for, you know, putting it on, things like that. I just want to thank everyone uh, for saying those comments. I'm sorry we can't specifically reply to them, but we take it on board and we've noted it. So I uh, really appreciate uh, all your comments and all your questions. Um, and there's a, some questions that we think have been answered perhaps in the presentation, which you can also download again, or that we've covered in one way or another. So apologies if we don't. Um, 
you know, don't, don't get to all of those either. Um, and uh, I saw a quick one here about, uh, can you use a Tesla motor? Again, it's an open platform. So there's a lot of transfer of technology from automotive into aerospace, but not normally you know, in aerospace, but in an electrification there is. Um, and so I think there's a lot of Tesla and or other manufacturer uh, knowledge and IP and potentially products coming into the sport as well. So, uh, so we can totally reshape how we think and, and how we perceive uh, putting aircraft together, not just from a design point of view, but from a supplier point of view as well, and really find other collaborations outside aerospace. It's also a really exciting thing. So, so absolutely. <clears throat> um, okay, guys, any, any last questions uh, that you can spot? Yeah, uh, I think also in F1 right now, the high, the deepest pockets do not win. And F1 has been doing that for a long time now. So I think that the, uh, the rules, the way they're set up work well. Yeah, and, and we're going to be conscious of that as, as we evolve and develop. Um, you know, at the same time, I want to add, let's let's hope let's hope there are some deep pockets. You know, I mean, at the same time, we all we want all the teams to have those deep pockets. That's that's what our job as the series is doing is creating that opportunity, the business opportunity, for you to develop a team and have deep pockets. So that what I mean by that is sponsors are coming on board to to help fund it. So uh, that we don't want that to be the driving force in the factor in the winners or the losers, but. We do want that to be part of the compelling reason to get involved. So, so that's always part of our thinking, you know, managing that situation. Um, I saw a question on sponsors and partners and, and are any of the really large companies that everyone recognizes. Uh, we do have, as you saw in the earlier slide, we have some very large companies that are coming in both as a sponsor to the league and, a, and then a lot of those sponsors are, are disseminating offers and opportunities and discounts to the teams, but then uh, you know, clearly this last year has been the most unusual year on record for any of us in our lifetimes. And so it's put, it's put, it's slowed down the pace of securing or solidifying some of uh, the sponsorship agreements we may all be working on because uh, just of the slowdown and the optics and so forth. But uh, there's a lot of interest from a lot of major companies. And, and I can tell you, I'm even working on, um, uh, uh, sponsorship opportunities that I hope to share with the, the league and every single team I'm going to be racing against. Um, the healthier we are and the safer we are, the better everyone's going to be and the more we can promote each other and promote the league, the better we're going to be. And so there's a lot of activity. Um, I think that uh, here in the next couple of months, uh, you know, as, as, as people get a handle on the crisis that's going on, uh, and, and, and the economy and industry starts opening back up, you're going to see a lot of those um, partnerships and sponsorships announced. And, and I'm just as excited about the small guys as I am about the big guys, by the way, because uh, um, a lot of them are much more willing to take a risk than some of the big guys. So there, there's a lot of opportunity there. And if you approach your team as both a, a business and an entertainment venue, there's just a lot of opportunity for synergy um, uh, between you and companies and you and the other teams. Great, great, great. Uh, yeah, really, thanks for that. And I echo Carl's, Carl's uh, statement there. Uh, I can see two quick questions here that I can answer quickly. There's um, uh, someone asked, why not do a stop and start type of race with change of the batteries? I mean, changing batteries and other types of configurations uh, are an interesting idea for us. Uh, because the races are so short, um, we're, we can actually, in a sense, do that because we're doing multiple races in a day anyway. So I should have highlighted that uh, the the teams charging obviously is a you know is a factor in the development and the usage and the utilization of electric propulsion um, is the charging and turnaround times. So we're actually going to be doing testing that as well and that technology of charging in the events. So we're going to be doing a race and then the same plane is going to be racing again in a short amount of time afterward, roughly about two hours at the moment uh, with the charging in between and of course getting the pilot fed and watered and everything else. Um, but there are multiple races, so they're heat races like Scott was talking about earlier, as you can build up and work your way up to the top ranks and during the race. So the format will always be looking at the balance of technology and fan basics, you know, excitement. And that matches with the next question that somebody's also asked 
about uh, are the qualifying events and of course the future events going to be streamed live? Absolutely. Um, and and it's, it's going to be online. We want it to be really accessible to everyone. Uh, we want really every step of the way to be accessible to everyone. So um, we're going to be working with the teams when they do their test flights to hopefully get some imagery out to people and we want to communicate what we're doing. Um, but the events that we organize are absolutely going to be uh, broadcast live, but they're also going to be on TV in over 100 countries, each event around the world. Uh, there are a lot of stories to tell. Uh, a lot of, as you can, uh, as you know from our already meeting our two guests here today, uh, a lot of fascinating people uh, that are involved in this. And there's a lot of content, a lot of material, a lot of good stories. Uh, so it's exciting times. Uh, and we want to communicate that as far and wide as we possibly can. So we will be doing that. Absolutely. I want to address one more question I saw in the comments. Someone asked uh, about international teams. This is an international league. Uh, we have uh, most, of, I think the majority of our teams are, are in the European space. We do have several um, America's entry, Scott and I both, Canada and US, mm -hmm. but, but the majority of the teams that are on board are, are in the European theater uh, and Eurasia continents. So um, the, definitely an international team. And then someone asked about, hey, is there someone in Northern California? Uh, like Scott said, uh, the people that we're closest with and working with, man, are scattered all over the world, all over the US. I've got, I've got people on my team, they're in the UK, in Taiwan, uh, and then I've scattered all over the US. So um, don't let geographical restrictions uh, uh, lock you into whether you're going to participate with one of the teams or with the league. Um, and definitely not if you're planning on standing up a team. Yes, absolutely international. Um, we're going to be all over the world. The league is international. Um, and, uh, you know, all comers welcome. So, and, well, and by the way, please contact me if you want to join a team. So. Yeah, I really do encourage you. I mean, you know, the, the reason we invited Scott and Carl is obviously they're really good. Uh, good at communicating, you know, getting in, people involved and they're enthusiastic to work with people. Uh, and they've demonstrated that over a long period of time. So, you know, these guys are, are good teams, as are all the teams, you know, to get involved. They're, they really want to share what they do. So please do contact these guys, uh, contact our other teams and certainly contact us. Um, like I said, again, in the chat, uh, hopefully you can all see the chat uh, uh, segment or window. Uh, there's a link to um, to some documents, so this presentation uh, and the rules of the event, as uh, as well as the actual expression of interest, which you can read. And if you uh, you know feel feel so moved, you can send that in, and get we can get started working together. Um, so I don't know, Scott and Carl, if you guys spot anything that you're just itching to answer, by all means, take a, a moment and and do that. Otherwise, in a few minutes, I think we're going to wrap up. Um, hopefully, we can also speak with each each of you uh, attendees uh, on a one to one basis going forward, and perhaps we'll have some more of these information sessions as we go go forward because we're we're excited that, like I said, 150 people registered uh, and uh, many attended, obviously. So, um, so really grateful for that. So, any final words or questions or final thoughts from Scott and Carl? Um, I, I'd be more than happy to answer anybody's questions. I see that uh, several questions here remain unanswered. Uh, even if you have private questions, I'm, I'm more than available. Feel free to call or email me. As my contact information is up there on the screen. Um, we, uh, we try and keep everybody updated on race team updates. Uh, Facebook page is Outlaw Air Racing if uh, anybody's interested. And I'd like to echo what Scott said. Uh, please reach out to us uh, with any questions. And if, if it's a question I can't answer, I'll pass you off to someone like Scott or Jeff uh, to get those questions answered because we want we want participation. Um, I see several questions about how to get involved or how to start. If you're thinking of starting up a team, um, absolutely reach out to Jeff and Air Race E, and they will find the right resources and the right people, and they will plug you in. Um, they will they will take you to the the the, the people that they think best match your uh, what your objectives are if you're looking to join a team or, or if you're looking for something more local to you, if you're looking to start a team, uh, that's the, you know, they're going to get you the information. And, uh, and then Scott and myself and others would be more than happy to kind of throw in our two cents worth to help help get you up and running. So don't, don't again, don't hesitate to reach out to any of us. 
Okay, fantastic. Well, listen, thank you, Scott and Carl, and a big thank you to everyone else who's interested in uh, uh, in, in learning more about RAC, whatever your interest level is, we're grateful for it. Um, and uh, we look forward to developing a, a real relationship with you guys as we go forward. Um, so, <clears throat> so, excuse me, so hopefully you found it interesting. I realized we had to gloss over a lot of things. There's a lot to cover, uh, a lot of material, but uh, we're here and we're looking forward to meeting you. So uh, thanks again, and we'll wish you guys all a good day and we'll talk to you soon. Okay, so thanks a lot. Goodbye, everyone.